Everything is everything is faster than I remembered it being. Hey, how's it going? This is Legends of the Drowned Isles, Campaign 2, The Great Confusion, a homebrew D&D 5th ed campaign uh, of a, a world called Omatia, which I have built and rebuilt and torn apart and uh, probably have left a few parts on the floor. But that's okay. It's a work in progress. I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One, host and GM for this game. Uh, and I'm very happy, once again, after a bit of a delay, after uh, a bit of a delay today and a bit of a delay uh, for several weeks, to welcome back my players again, starting on my left with Pat. Uh, my name is Pat. I'm playing Silas Marsh. Uh, if things go wrong on my end, it's because I'm using a little laptop. Hi, uh, my name is Marie, and I'll be jumping out to check on some uh, some flan. And I'm playing Annie. <laughs> Should mention that too. Hey, I'm Nax, and I'm playing Medrek, half orc cleric. All right, and yes, we may have a a a. It needs to be something it's like a flan anniversary or some sort of <laughs> some sort of commemorative moment there. But uh, in the meantime, a quick summary of where we were and uh, potentially where we're going as well. Uh, it is Yuri the 17th of 3108 in uh, the town of Ilthvater on the western shore of Eskis, one of the 55 islands in the world of Omatia. And uh, over the town remains a festival that was sort of called in to celebrate the end of a terrible attack uh, brought forth uh, by numerous parties, as it turns out, uh, not least of which from the uh, Sea Devils, but also from uh, what seems to be the resurrected uh, last remnant of an ancient race. It's kind of confusing there. In any case, Circus Maximus has come to town, and the crew have been investigating different places and parts of it. For a while, though, they investigated a haunted house and found it to be somewhat more than what they had believed it to be. In the fourth area they found themselves in, a vast cave, it mirrored the subterranean lair of a nearby gynosphinx they know as Catherine, who herself has some um, extra dealings both with them and with forces beyond. And including the gynosphinx herself in this particular vision of the space in her typical position in front of their, on the altar. But in front of them, un un normal, not normal for the subterranean lair, were three tall crystals, each containing a figure inside. One seemed to be a guard who looked vaguely familiar. Another seemed to be Flamekeeper Tidewell, who was lost during the assault on Aelthvater, the former leader of the Church of Ignis in this area, the Temple of Ignis in this area, uh, of which uh, Medric is a follower. And the third held a figure that Silas had not seen for some time, his wife, Molly, who had been lost at sea quite some time ago. Catherine stalked forward but seemed confused, slipping between threats and statements of disappointment and bewilderment. She seemed confused as to why she was really there, and switched to declaring the people in the crystals as things holding this three back and threatening to destroy them. Uh, as they all paused in wonder, Catherine shook her head and then said, Something is wrong. The realm shook, dirt drifted from the ceiling, and cracks formed in the walls. Worm-like creatures, one large and a few smaller ones, burst through the rocky surfaces, leaving gaping holes behind, revealing not uh, more dirt, but in fact a sea of stars. Catherine herself tumbled through one of these holes, filling and falling into a dark void beyond. She spun and floated away beyond the reach of their rope and was quickly lost. The bigger of the beings continued punching more holes through the walls and ceiling and floor, and a few townspeople tumbled through, apparently caught up in its wake. They were confused and scared and desperate themselves to get away. The holes presented an immediate threat, and each as each one opened up, they were, the group were forced to scramble to the way and help the newcomers, too. The smaller worms poked out of the other holes, threatening to drag anyone nearby into the void beyond. Uncertain as to whether the people inside the crystals were real or illusion, Silas reached out with magic in his mind to sp speak to Molly and was surprised to find a real and true connection. Remembering the rules of this strange place, Silas called out for Tauzek Riva, 
the beholder that seemed to be their host, and asked him if the way to get out was to smash the crystals, which it confirmed, saying that it was symbolic of them leaving their pasts behind. Annie shattered the crystal before her, and the one with the guardsman inside. He stood there before her, saluted, and told her it was an honor to serve her. Then, as though his body was wind, it seemed like his spirit blew away. Silas smashed the crystal in front of him, and Molly stood there in the flesh before him. She stepped forward and embraced him. She felt warm and solid, but Silas was still dubious. She whispered into his ear, and she held him close, telling him, I have to leave you now, but we'll see each other soon. Keep looking. I am between. With that, she kissed him and vanished. Medric struck the crystal before him, and the flamekeeper was freed. She nodded solemnly and told him that she was proud of him, but for vanishing much like the others. An opening appeared on the far side of the room, conveniently labeled with glowing magical letters. Exit, it said. The group gathered the others and raced toward it. Just before stepping through, Silas asked his third question of Tauzek Rifa. He asked about what would have happened if they had fallen into the void. The beholder replied with a shivering of eye stalks that approximated to shrug, saying that the worms and the void were not part of his trick. Once through the exit, everyone found themselves back in the same small room where they had first entered. Tauzek Rifa sent the others away with a prize coupon and a dismissive comment, but gave the group a few trinkets and choice of several powerful prizes or a bag of holding. To claim their prize, Tauzek Riva gave them a message for Willoweth the Mysterious, the host on the outside, or barker perhaps, of this event, then showed them the door. They emerged from the same cloth tunnel of the haunted house they originally entered in, and the suddenly noisy and very normal survival uh, surroundings rather of the of the carnival. Once they presented the message to Willoweth, he frowned, and after emptying out a small sack of imp on a, of an impossibly large amount of things, he then handed over the bag of holding. So congratulations on having your bag of holding. That's an approximation of what happened in the previous session. Outside of the haunted attraction, uh, our... Uh, Silas's parents uh, had them in a list a moment ago and then realized I didn't bring them up again. Um, I believe it is uh, uh, Udaw and... Oh, where are we here? Uh, uh, do you remember Silas's parents' name, Silas? <laughs> uh, Yule... Uh, dang it. I have it somewhere, but not on this laptop. Yeah, I have it. I have him just slowly uh, scrolling here. Uh, They're generally known as Silas's parents. Pretty much, yeah. That's weird that I don't have this sort of the proper way. But Yule is uh, the the father's name, and I, I it's there somewhere. But they are they are there yeah. holding your young son Nikki, who was forbidden to go into the uh, haunted house. Maybe it was for good reason that uh, they don't allow children in this particular event or ride. Uh, Willoweth uh, had closed down the ride after you had gone through. Uh, maybe it was the fact that the prize that he didn't think he was going to be giving away was. Uh, but the carnival is is now uh, in full swing around you. And as I mentioned in the in the description, um, you suddenly realize how how quiet it was in that other realm uh, as the crowds now pour in upon you. And there's performers per on every other street corner making uh, a little bit of coin uh, with their hats out and uh, playing mandolins and so forth. What do you guys want to do? There are more games to be had, more uh, rides to be seen, more events. Copying and pasting the uh, game descriptions into a notepad file where I can actually see it all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that and is... I'm remembering the games that are available in the carnival. <laughs> Silas will uh, pick Nikki up from his parents and um, see what Nikki wants to do. Nikki is happy to see you, but uh, I didn't mean this to rhyme, but Nikki is very sticky. Apparently, he's been having some. Uh, some treats of one kind or three. 
uh, and his face in, and fingers are covered in a sort of amber, uh, amber generic stickiness, I guess I might say. Cool. Uh, well, Silas will take some time to clean Nikki up. All right. Um, your, uh, your father looks a little bit guilty. Um, it didn't look like it was going to be that messy when I bought it, but he seemed, the boy seemed to like it, so. That's fine. I'm sure he enjoyed it. Didn't you, Nikki? More. Now you'll get to enjoy the sugar high later. Mm-hmm. You can already see the, the beginnings of the twitchiness uh, as uh, Nikki, while content for the moment to, to hold up in your arms, uh, this young boy is eager to run and to, uh, to uh, do everything. You might imagine. There are a number of smaller games as well. Um, I've given you guys a list of some of the, the larger ones that might be of interest. And the ones that generally do yield prize vouchers. Um, there are a lot of smaller ones that yield um, wooden toys or um, small um, things that would be for children as well. Um, things like uh, yo-yos or... Uh, Little prizes, little whistles, wooden whistles, things like that. Uh, small dolls. I, the player, am extremely intrigued by Flight of the Ferrets. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see that game not too far away, and there's a there's a kind of a, a, a U-shaped crowd around this. Um, and you can kind of make out that, that people are kind of is just as intrigued as Annie is. Um, and you can see that there's a bit of jockeying for position. Uh, some of the small folk are having, having to kind of push through. Uh, a few of the halflings and gnomes are, are kind of uh, trying to, to shove their way through to see a, see a little bit uh, uh, more clearly. Uh, there's, there's a weird hush that happened that kind of moves over the crowd for a few seconds, and then there's the a loud thud wang as, uh, as wood and steel uh, kind of flex and bounce. And above the crowd, you do see uh, what looks like uh, an actual live ferret flying <laughs> through the air, doing its best to tumble, and then it falls out of sight below the crowd once more, about 15 feet away. A loud cheer goes up, uh, and that seems to be the direction you need to head if you want to play this game. Why would people throw a ferret? That doesn't seem safe for I don't know. people or I, ferrets. Silas <laughs> is going to like push his way through the crowd so he can see where the ferret landed, but holding Nikki in such a way that Nikki can't see just in case something got nasty. <clears throat> Nikki is squirming like mad to see right now because he, he heard the crowd and then looked up and saw an animal flying through the air. His one finger... <laughs> Is pointing up at that and and kind of reaching out to grab that uh, the idea, even though it's way far away. Um, with a child, it's a little easier to some degree. Some people are are, are a little bit nicer. They they kind of uh, turn to you with a, an angry uh, look. But when they see the child, they kind of melt a little bit and step back and leave you some space. And you can see as right. you move through the the crowd a bit more um, that uh, uh, there is a a almost a, a, a runway kind of spaced out about 20 feet long at the one end is where the ferret started. And you can see what looks to be some sort of wooden contraption. Um, it takes you a moment because you haven't seen these in operation, but you have heard of siege engines before. Uh, and it looks like a sort of miniature version of a siege engine at the far end. There's a lot of straw that's been laid out in a large circular pattern and little, uh, little, uh, uh um, uh, bean bags essentially have been placed out of different colors, different distances, making a rough approximation of a bullseye. And you can see as you kind of push your way through, uh, the ferret kind of pops its head up out of the uh, out of the uh, uh, straw and kind of lumbers its way uh, quite quickly back to the front, um, where a uh, a, a dwarven uh, woman uh, kind of reaches down and it picks something out of out of her out of her hand and starts to chew madly on it, uh, seemingly ready for more treats. 
Uh, it's like again, good. again. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems to be real. Uh, it seems to uh, not be harming the we, the uh, ferret then. The ferret oh, doesn't to seem to be too uh, well. It seems to be extraordinarily enthusiastic about what's going on right now. Um, uh, as are the the uh, sort of crowd around. Uh, you see a uh, a uh, young uh, human boy uh, standing behind the, fer- the behind the the contraption, however, with his sort of arms crossed and his uh, his face in a in a kind of frowny, angry uh, look. Uh, you get a feeling that might have been the previous contestant. <laughs> uh, Medric, uh, are you moving through the crowd as well? Oh yeah, I'm following them. There's a oh, natural. He's making a path for us. There's a natural distance that people tend to keep from you, uh, and when you bump into someone, mostly because they backed into you, they quickly move away, and you kind of see them uh, rubbing their elbow. Um, your natural heat uh, radiates quite strongly, and it kind of naturally parts the crowd as you move through. Nice. Um, so I guess best I don't even person need to go camping with. <laughs> yeah, he is the blanket uh, <laughs> uh, and Annie it's easy enough for you to kind of slip through the crowd um, I'm assuming you're doing so kind of nonchalantly or, or without drawing too much attention yeah as I do okay um, the uh, dwarven woman uh, um, puts her puts her hand out flat the ferret kind of sniffs her hand but doesn't find anything there so and then just sort of crawls up her her arm to, to stand on her shoulder and then step up onto her head to kind of stir, surveying the crowd as both she and the, and the ferret sort of look around uh, at the, the crowd. So who's going to be the next taker? Who's going to be the next one to make my little ferret fly? And the ferret seems to be almost mirroring her gestures that she's trying to welcome the crowd in and all that. And little ferrets making its little hands move in, in very similar uh, ways. Uh, every once in a while having to readjust as the as the uh, uh, the head tilts one way or another. You said the, the thing that launched the ferret is like a modified siege engine? Or? Yeah, kind of like a trebuchet. So it's, okay. it's ab- only about uh, about three feet long. It is a pivot in the center and a, and a, and a cup-like thing on one side and a heavy weight on the other. Okay. Uh, and you can see that there's a, a large, um, I don't know exactly how trebuchets work, but I believe that they basically it's by tension. So they, they, they uh, tense up the, the, uh, the supporting rod between the cup end and the other end with weights, latching it at the cup end. And then when they release, they release the cup end. Okay. Goes, I mean, it wouldn't count as a land vehicle, would it? No. Uh, it's not really a vehicle. Okay. If you had uh, war machines or something like that as a, as a, a, a proficiency, then it would be proficient with it. Okay. Uh, it ha- it is on uh, a pair of wheels, and there's a a small wheel at the at the uh, the the sort of firing end. The whole thing looks like it does turn and twist a little bit. Okay. It, it's a, it's a siege weapon. <laughs> yeah. It is a very miniature st- siege weapon. Uh. It's this red ferret. Um, Seems to be. I'm assuming I would have uh, seen them used before and possibly used on myself, though, right? Uh, MJ waves hello to everybody. (laughs) 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 Uh, It's a little ferret that's going to be lost. Um, (laughs) Actually, yeah, Medric, from your war experience, you would have seen the full-sized versions in operation. Um, They are they are tremendously powerful. They are meant to large launch large rocks, often large flaming or oiled or otherwise awful rocks, uh, onto, into, and through castle walls. Um, this one is not quite so powerful as that. You would imagine that if you were to, to, uh, to, to tighten it up enough, you could get a fair amount of distance. The 15 feet or so to the other end where the target is, that wouldn't be that hard to actually get that far um, from this. But the, okay. the target itself is about 10 feet wide, suggests that it's not necessarily all that accurate. Okay. Do any of you have animal training or animal handling as a trained skill? No. Nope. No. Okay. Uh, I don't think, I think Annie is curious about the safety of the ferret more than wanting to play it. <laughs> okay. Nikki's reaching towards the ferret. What? No, Nikki. No pets yet. 
want my own flying. You uh, mean you want to fly in the Maybe we can get you a ferret. It won't fly, though. <laughs> uh, what is the name of your flying snake, by the way? Gideon, I think. Oh, now you're asking me a month after I saw it. <laughs> uh, no, I'm pretty sure it is Gideon. I think I think Gideon, I think you guys got it right. Yeah. That's yeah. That's right. Add that to my list here. Um, because I had forgotten that. And I don't think uh, Gideon is here. Um, no. He probably should have been, but I forgot about him. So No, that's fine. He probably gets a little bit overwhelmed in crowds anyway. Um, kind of the opposite of Nikki in many ways. Uh, also not a human child, so that would be an also an opposite. But um, but that's probably what Nikki's referring to, uh, kind of reaching out towards the, the uh, ferret and calling it another flying. Um, <laughs> because he would have played with Gideon quite a bit, but he knows that Gideon mm -hmm. isn't his so much. One ticket, three tries. Can you make my little bugger fly? Look, and she kind of reaches sure up and, and scratches it under the neck. It was matching all of her movements. And then when she moved her hand up, it was also moving its hand up. When it realized the purpose was to scratch it beneath the, the neck, it kind of leans in and quite happily uh, accepts the scratches. A little bit of an awe from the crowd. Um, oh, are we are we getting cat cam? Cat cam. Oh, you're you're muted, Pat. We see an ear in our screen, but I don't think you can in I the other one. I just need to check something on a computer that actually has my sheets on it. <laughs> well, in the meantime, um, a, uh, a familiar-looking uh, 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 halfling steps up in rather dandyish clothes, uh, along with uh, 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 Marigold. You do see uh, one of the three bells. Brandy, in fact, is there uh, kind of with him. Brandy looks a little bit dubious, but uh, but Marigold looks like he's kind of curious and hands over uh, a token for uh, the attempts. Oh, nice. This should be good. Uh, the uh, Barker puts her arm on uh, towards the cup and the little thing scampers down and kind of rests itself, kind of circles itself in the cup. Uh Marigold is given instructions you can't really hear. It's just the crowd noise is a little bit too much. Uh, he looks up a little bit more dubious than when he first started this, but nods his head as if in for a penny, in for a pound. Uh, walks over to the device, and you can see there are two handles on either side of where the, the, the cup of the, of the trebuchet actually is. And he kind of pulls a little bit to try to adjust uh, and you can see it's a bit of a strain for him to adjust this. The the thing rolls on the two wheels, and kind of pivots on those with the other other third wheel acting as the the third point of the of a triangle. You kind of adjust it, kind of looking down the edge of it, uh, and then he uh, he takes a deep breath, reaches down, and you can see below this there's a hand crank, and so he proceeds to to crank the tighten up the trebuchet, and you can see the the straight out line of the trebuchet itself is starting to just ever so slightly bend and then he kind of stands up you can see his face is somewhat red and he, he he wipes off his uh his uh um his uh, brow nods his head and then reaches over and presses the little wooden lever that's beside the catapult Kachunk! It releases the catapult swings or the tre the trebuchet swings up, 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 and the thwang goes straight, and that's where it sort of is meant to stop. And out of the little ball leaps the ferret. But it, you get the impression uh, actually. Um, yeah, let's just have a have a. Uh, I don't really need a roll for this, but you all kind of notice that the ferret uh, leaps out. But kind of lackadaisically, sort of like, is, is, is that all? Is that it? And pushes forward out of this. Uh, and you can see as it's kind of going and going and going, it's a lot lower than before. It might not have even have uh -oh. crested where the level of the crowds uh, are. Uh, and uh, and there's, a big, there's a big anticipation in the crowd as it's kind of sucking in its breath and they get kind of quiet. 
and it's kind of just sort of turning and twisting in midair, uh, kind of slowly. And for a moment there, the, the whole thing sort of slows down a little bit. And then just as it's sort of getting to the edge of the, uh, the grassy area, it sort of twists a little bit and lands pretty comfortably on, on the, the, the grass, but well outside the outermost ring of this whole thing. And there's a big awe oh, that goes down in the crowd. And then the thing scampers back, uh, gets a treat from the uh, the barker, and then uh, who immediately has her hand stretched out on the other side, uh, and it runs down and curls once more into the into the bowl. <clears throat> Actually, I should say. Then, in the meantime, she is she is reached over and with one hand pushed down the the uh, the catapult or trebuchet, which you you see is is sort of uh, counterweighted. So it's not like she was super strong, but there's nothing for her to, to really push against. It just sort of balances back to its even state. Uh, and once more, the thing crawls into the bowl. Um, a little more frustrated looking now, uh, Marigold tries once more. Um, this time, uh, cranking it even farther. And you can see him kind of leaning into it and practically lifting his whole body to try to get around one more half turn. Um, How far away from him are we? How far away do you want to be? I get the like impression that, we're that Silas was more towards the other end. He was more towards the end where it was landing. Okay. Uh, Medrick and Annie can be wherever you want to be. I was going to like just look at people using the trebuchet. and I'll wave to Dr. Marigold, see if he calls me over. Um, he, he, uh, he notices you there and, and, and waves an acknowledgement. He's taking a breath uh, to kind of, or taking a moment to catch his breath a little bit. Um, <laughs> The uh, Barker is warning him, you only have a few seconds before it goes off on its own, so if you're going to do anything more... And he's like, I don't think I can... Oh, it's good to see a familiar face. And uh, Brandy behind him. Uh, he can't see her, but she gives you a look, first of all, of familiarity, but also this sort of, oh boy, um, almost embarrassed look that he's trying so hard to do this. <laughs> um so you can you can approach if you want, but it looks like he's in the midst of this. All right, I'll ask. Uh, need help? Oh, that would be good, lad. But I, I think I've got it. I, it's been a long time since I've had to do uh, this sort of heavy lifting, but uh, I, I've got a couple more attempts in me. Besides, All right, I, well. I put my ticket down, and uh, I'm gonna win. Damn it! Uh, <laughs> Well, if you need a hand, let me know. And I'll go line up at the thing. Okay. Um, he he gets down to try to give it another half turn, and it just sort of barely squeaks, and he's oh. sort of like, all right. This time he's angling it after he's moved. Maybe that's a strategy, maybe not. Uh, and kind of lining it up. Um, you can hear this as you're getting, as you're close there now, and you're pretty much next in line because everybody else is curious, but not too many people are lining up. Um, you can now hear the sort of click, click, click of the thing itself. And you can see there's a little gear that's turning underneath. Um, and it looks as though it's turning, uh, uh, you know, one step, two step, three step, which every time it clicks a little bit, you, you see him move a little bit faster to try to line this up. Uh, and this time I will have him roll. Um, I'm just like trying to observe how much, how many cranks result in how much distance, basically. He managed to get four cranks, four and a smidge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's about all he managed there. Uh, let's see that one. Okay. Uh, and no thing there. Okay. So this time um, he he kind of he kind of lets it he steps back actually from it, and you hear as the click 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 hits about six or seven clicks. You're not really paying too much attention to the number, but it feels about six or seven, uh, and the thing lets go on its own, uh, and you get the feeling that what the uh, dwarven barker had said about this that it will release on its own is it will release after you stop turning. So there's a chance to, uh, so the, you, it will move on its own, even if you can't take a long break, basically, in between. Okay. And this time, it releases. 
Once again, you see the ferret kind of fly up a little bit higher this time. It looks as though he might have actually managed to get maybe even a whole quarter turn more than the previous time. Um, once again, though, the ferret seems kind of bored, weirdly enough. <laughs> Not really reacting, just kind of moving through the sky. And from the angle you're seeing it at now, you can actually tell that it's a little bit straighter on. Um, the first time he had fired this thing, uh, not only was it uh, outside the circle, but you realize it was actually outside the circle and slightly off. So if he had done a lot more power, he would have been out on the other side, probably. Uh, it wouldn't have been any closer to the center. Once again, as the ferret starts to get closer and closer to the, the ground, it twists once again, and this time he's made it into the first rung, and a cheer goes up around the crowd uh, <laughs> as the, as the uh, ferret uh, kind of stops for a moment, kind of rolls around like it's scratching an itch a little bit, and then pops its head back up and runs back. Ah, better. All right. He said second rung was for the first prize, right? All right. I think I can. I think I can do that. And so wait, this wait, time, wait. Wait, he's wait. trying once more. You got this, Marigold, and I'll give him guidance. Tap him on the back. Okay. Remember the flash of fire. Yeah. So uh, there is a flash of fire. You are not a subtle spellcaster. Um, which the crowd kind of, well, let's see, let's see how many people notice. Um, why is this, um, it's doing a thing. But I'm assuming their eyes would be on the ferret. Their eyes are on the ferret and him, but I'm going to just have it, uh, uh. Actually, does a cantrip cause, uh, cause him fire damage? It no. doesn't cause any fire damage, but there's always a little burst of, of fire. Uh, this okay. would be the equivalent of essentially of a match going off. Um, so it's not very powerful. Um, and I'm going to have them, just going to have a general crowd notice roll. They aren't really paying attention to him. Uh, yeah, no. Nobody seems to notice except for Marigold, uh, nice. who seems to, to uh, quirk an eye up. And then there's a sort of slow smile that crosses his face. All right. We'll do this one more time. So once again, uh, he will attempt with a bit of guidance to crank the thing in a little bit more. Okay. Uh, you see him straining really, really hard. And this time he doesn't take a break. He kind of finds a way to kind of lean into the thing and you can see his knuckles getting, getting white. You can see his body starting to shake a little bit and he gets it up to almost five cranks this time. A lot better a little closer, he kind of steps back and again, click, click, click. And so he starts to aim the thing. Uh, that one. Uh, and this time you you see it uh, uh, go kathwang. Once again, kathodun, when it gets up to the center point where it hits the cross brace. And once again, though, unenthusiastically, kind of just sort of swept out of the bowl, the uh, little critter kind of sort of walks, wanders through the sky as it's flying along. It, 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 it's weird. It, it's maybe time slows down when you're watching such a strange sight, but it sort of looks around and starts scanning the crowd. Um, this time it does a little bit of a half dip, allowing itself to kind of use its own momentum to flip forward a little bit. Uh, and at, once again, as it gets closer, this time it seems to prepare a little bit earlier uh, and actually prepare to land backwards. Somehow it's managed to twist itself. You see its spine kind of twisting and it tw spins all around and lands backwards on four, on four uh, legs and lands in the second rung this time. Nice. And uh, uh, the crowd cheers. The Barker uh, 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 laughs. And says, well done, well done. You've managed to get the second rung. That's a first level prize. And uh, Marigold's kind of standing up a little bit. He's, he's actually still still half doubled over with the effort. All right, I did it. And uh, the Barker hands him a singular uh, uh, prize token. Okay. Uh, 
all for you. And he hands it over to uh, Sandy, who accepts it and trying not to look, trying to look uh, proud and happy, but at the same time, a little bit, um, a little bit worried and kind of embarrassed. Uh, she accepts the token and she reaches out her hand to him to pull him up to a standing, <laughs> standing straight. Now, uh, maybe some, something to eat. And uh, she nods her head and, you know, he probably intended to, to lead her by the arm out, but it's more like she's supporting him, <laughs> uh, carrying him out from the crowd. The crowd parts amiably. And the ch- chant starts to go up more, more, more. And indeed, the this time uh, the the barker is kind of uh, smiling, proud. The the little uh, uh, critter critter on her head has got its both hands up as well, pumping for the crowd as well. The crowd notices that there's a laughter that goes up, and the cheer goes up louder and louder. And the barker calls out, "Who's next? Who will send my little friend flying?" You're next in line, Medrick. Yeah, but I remembered Annie has my tickets, or Annie, I was bumming Annie's tickets until I can get my tickets and give them back. <laughs> or Silas's tickets. Well, you can easily see Silas. Annie's a little or harder. Or Silas will give you a it. ticket. Awesome. All right. All right, so how many tickets do I owe to each person now? I, I'm going to keep a list because otherwise I will forget. Uh, it doesn't matter. This isn't intended for you to go into ticket debt. That's not. That's not how this game is supposed to work. I just forgot to get some at the beginning, and now I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> You're still right. muted. I believe you owe me two. <laughs> <laughs> so, Medric, how are you approaching this? Well, I'll make sure I aim it the exact same way Marigold aimed it, because he aimed it pr- properly. Okay. It seems to have shifted when the when the weight of the of the the bar goes up and and hits against the crossbar, the whole thing tilts and shifts a little bit, so it doesn't stay okay. aimed. Uh, when you say it landed in the second rung, was it like in line with the center, or was it like? It was pretty close. Was it just like okay? So I'll aim it towards the center as much as possible. Try to have the trebuchet in the same location that it was before, and. Okay. I'll compare. Okay, so the first time he landed, or the ferret landed in the first rung. Kind of so on how many, the edge, edge of, yeah. the, of the outermost rung, yeah. So I'll try to just kind of estimate based on the difference in, in, the, in the number of cranks between the first and the second rung. I'll add that amount of cranks to whatever I'm cranking, basically. Okay. So um, are you aiming first or are you cranking first? Oh, crank first. Okay. That would be an athletics check, please. All right. Oops. Take the first one. I accidentally double clicked. So that's a 14. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's at first, the first couple of turns around are pretty light and then it starts to really get very, very, very heavy. Um, you managed to get it around about six and a half cranks. So another okay. full crank practically around, uh, from where actually, uh, almost a crank and a, and three quarters around from where Marigold had, which is a pretty cons- substantial amount. It does start to, to get a little heavy at that point. So pretty good. All right. And now, then I'll yeah, aim it. It starts to click immediately. So you have yep. basically six seconds to aim. Um, yep. This Just is line up and try to get the length of the beam pointing towards the center of the circle. Okay. This is a perception check. Oh, man. I'm not. I'm a perceptive ish. Not really. As you're, li- as you're no. lining it down the, the barrel. Um, you're kind of holding the two handles and kind of turning it back and forth. And the ferret kind of pops up on the side of, on, on the, on the end of the cup and puts its hands across, uh, underneath its chin and starts to watch you. And it gets a little Move. bit unnerving. And then you realize, oh shit, 
uh, as the seventh click sounds and the thing starts to release from your hands. Make a dexterity saving throw. Nineteen. Nineteen. You manage to step back just in time to avoid uh, either being hit by the trebuchet or uh, slowing it down. And thoof, it launches off. And you're looking and you're watching. And again, the, the unenthusiasm of a flying rodent is somewhat surprising. As it kind of turns, and it actually turns sideways and starts to roll a little bit. Uh, making it even more of a weird gesture and kind of stretches out its its arms lackadaisically. Make a insight check. Actually, sorry, make an animal handling check. We'll do that way. Oh, no, man, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll do insight. No, I'll do insight because this is much more of, a, of a, a humanoid gesture. Fuck. Seven. Seven? Okay. It was a weirdly human gesture, almost as though it was kind of just stretching to get a little bit more uh, uh, relaxation out of this. Uh, Annie and Silas can also make insight checks as you watch this. I'm assuming you're watching this. Nikki is definitely watching this and uh, kind of keeps, every time the, the ferret flies by, reaches out as if to try to grab it in midair. Okay. Yeah, Silas is there. That's a 16 from Silas from uh, Annie. It, 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 does it look like it's maneuvering its body to like get away from the center? Yeah. Uh, that's a fifteen for Annie. 15. For insight, okay. Um, perhaps it's the number of falls you've taken on your own, Annie, in practice and kind of getting into the 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 practice of getting out of the the castle or different things you've had to do over time. But there's something familiar about the way that it's moving. You can't quite put your finger on it. Silas, um, although not quite as familiar with flying or falling, um, you kind of realize that it's deliberately stretching itself out. It's deliberately kind of moving against the force that was launching it, as though it would shorten up the distance a little bit more. And sure enough, when it lands, it lands right on the edge of the first innermost ring. And the crowd kind of sadly uh, 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 cries out, oh, uh, and the barker says, oh, so close this time, so close. Well, you've still got two more tries. Oh, yeah. And the ferret once more runs back, enthusiastically eating up a little bit of, of nibbles and then running into the, the cup. I, as a player, have a theory, but Metric did not do well on the inside checks. So. <laughs> well, he might have a clue. Um, yeah. The fact that he was like, that the, the ferret was just like looking like this is just like fucking with me. I'm pretty sure that's like a weird ferret or like some kind of druid. Well, um, Medric <laughs> didn't make that particular role, but if you can figure out what role Medric might be trying to do to figure this out, I would allow yeah. that. And it I'll could do the be second. something. It could be something mm -hmm. related to warfare. It could be something related to animals. You aren't trained in animal handling, but no. you could try making a roll, or you could look at some other skill that would make sense. Uh, maybe nature, I guess, or or survival. <laughs> Whatever you can make a case for, I'm willing to listen. I have athletics, insight, intimidation. Hey. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a trained skill. It just means okay. that you're not going to do as well because you won't have your, your proficiency bonus. Um, if not, you can go ahead and go back to the mechanical uh, uh, movement of the thing and try to figure out how to how to aim it better or how to crank better. Because I'm pretty sure like this... No. So, Medrick would have been... The only thing he has to go by was how the ferret was looking at him, like almost with a human look, right? Yeah, I mean, Our? ferrets are weirdly, you know, expressive, you guess. Haven't had a okay. lot of ferret experience. All right. I'll do the same thing. So just give it the same amount of cranks. Okay. 
Because in theory, like the amount of cranks I gave it should have landed it further than it did. That's uh, another athletics roll. All right. Fuck. Nine. Okay. You're struggling a little bit to get it the right number of cranks, but you lose track at one point, and you're pretty sure it was the same. Six and a half. Totally. <laughs> now making an aim roll. This time, the the um, little critter has kind of rolled over onto its back, and it's kind of hanging its head. These are very, very flexible, strangely flexible creatures. And it's kind of hanging its head and a bit of its neck back over and looking up at you upside down, making a little bit of noise, chittering noise. Yeah, exactly. Is it trying to distract me? Um, let's see if it works. Make a, uh, a charisma saving throw. <laughs> 15. 15. Okay. Uh, despite the fact that this little thing is directly in your face, you're kind of like, nope, nope, got to pay attention, got to pay attention. It starts to make some other really, really rude noises. And not everybody can pick up on it. Some of the crowd nearby, and he's not too far away. You can kind of hear some of the little <laughs> kind of noises it's making. Yeah, it's definitely you're focused, trying to distract me. You're focused entirely on the, on the action in front of you. All right. And now line this thing up. Lighting a tick, thing up. Tick. Mark. Before it ticks, I, before it fires, like during those last few seconds, I know time is kind of stretching there, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to make my eyes flare like a little extra fiery, and I'll be like, don't fuck this up at okay. the ferret, like trying to intimidate it, basically. All right. Um, I heard from uh, Silas. Do you want to jump in there, too? And also for Manny. So Silas first. Uh, no, I'll wait. We'll see how okay. it goes. Annie? I was just gonna gonna say I, I've never heard a ferret make fart noises, but this one does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, did you want to come around, Silas, to uh, to an idea, or you want to wait still? No, I'm waiting for. He's got one more shot, so okay. Yeah, so I'll try to make, intimidate the ferret to like, if it knows what's what's good for it, it's not gonna fuck uh, us up. Make an intimidation check with advantage for the little flare oh, yeah. of the eyes. You do hear a response from the crowd as well, because that's pretty obviously noticeable. Uh, you have weird eyes to begin with, but every time you focus and they go up a little bit bigger, there is a bit more determination. Yeah, so 16. Okay. Uh, it kind of rolls and ducks into the bowl and then peeks its little head up just to see you're still there. Uh, make a, uh, a perception check at disadvantage to target. Oh, the, hey, 20. Wow, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, despite the sort of uh, glare you give, and you can hear continually tick, tick, tick of the of the counter counting down, you do manage to kind of uh, at the last moment go, "Aha!" There's one little part uh, of the of the crossbar crossbar that's there that sticks up ever so slightly. And if you use that as a guide, it's not in the center, but you use that as a guide, kind of off to where it is that should be enough, and fadoof, the thing launches off. Um, this time, I'll keep giving uh, the fear of the evil eye the entire time it flies. <laughs> it's hard well, to the catch its eye because it's moving in rather random directions. Uh, but this time, uh, it kind of rolls itself up into a ball. Strangely enough, maybe you intimidate. Must be because of your intimidation. It must really be kind of paying attention now. Uh, and as it gets closer and closer and closer. The crowd is uh, on the edge because it's not flattening out. It's staying in this tight little bald form. Uh, and as you see it come down, uh, you, you see it kind of spring its back a little bit. And then you realize that it just barely lands in the straw. You were way too short this time. You must have miscounted those, those cranks. It must have been four and a half, not six and a half. That was way too light. That was almost as light as Marigold's first attempt. Uh, and the crowd lets out a sigh of relief as it does land just on the edge of, of the, the straw. It takes a couple of moments this time and kind of uh, stretches a little bit more and scratches some of the straw. It takes a little bit of the straw, nibbles it, spits it out. Uh, and you hear this little little whisp whistle from the uh, the barker uh, as it kind of perks its head up and kind of remembers where the hell it is runs back, gets its treat, and sits back in the bowl. That's okay, son. Third time's the charm. Oh, yeah. 
does uh, any or uh, Silas have anything they want to interject while he attempts his third try? I have nothing I can can do to help it, so I'm just like, you get this. Uh, actually, mm-hmm. can I use Master of Tactics? Uh, if it's this... something you feel you can do that would help. So if you've got advice, which it could be another role, or it could be, if there's something you, you figured out. Um. Hmm. I feel like I would have had some experience with trebuchets, not enough to like be proficient in them, because chance of me being in the front lines, I'm not. There would have been there would have been training that was going on that you probably were forced to oversee at one point. Yeah. Or you would have seen I, it from the castle. I have been taught how to use them. It does not mean I know how to use them, but I've been taught how to use them. <laughs> Level of knowing. Okay. Um, but I'll like. Give some advice from that. <laughs> uh, okay. Can you feel a, what would be an appropriate role um, that you could make? Mm-hmm. We'll set the difficulty at 10 because you're just helping. You're not doing it yourself. But that will give him um, advantage on one of those roles, uh, depending on, on what he chooses. Um, maybe a history role to see if I can remember it properly. Yeah, sure. I'll allow that. So go ahead and roll difficulty ten. That that is that is um a nine. A nine. So you're reaching back into your, your past history and you're you're thinking, I, I know there was something and The doodag, the doodag. <laughs> <laughs> so what what is that what you is that what Annie yells out to Medrick to try to help? It, 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 it's like Pull, pull on the doodag because my brain never remembered what that part of the of it was called. <laughs> okay, all right. The crank. So, Med- Med- you get this bizarre <laughs> advice. Pull on the doodag, and you can interpret that how you will. Um, Silas, it, 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 it's it's a time of like memorizing when you like constantly forget that one thing. So it's like the thingy. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, this this bizarre conversation goes back in which neither knows any idea what the other's actually saying. Pull on the doodag. What? You know, the thingy. This thingy? What? No, like unless Annie, that's the doodag. Annie knows exactly what she's talking about, <laughs> but does not know the word. <laughs> yeah, in, in the moment here, maybe drawn, drowned a little bit by the crowd that's, that's kind of enthusiastically chanting. In fact, there is a bit of a chant that's going up around the space as uh, some of the locals start to chant, Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix. Doodag, doodag. <laughs> and his chance is a little bit different than everyone else's. Um, does Silas want to try to help out his friend? Well, Silas is getting ready to do something, but it'll happen at the moment when uh, Medrick is just about to fire it. So, Okay. Everybody's attention is on Medrick after all. So, mm-hmm. so we'll call that holding your reaction. Um, yep. If it is a spell, then you will be, uh, unless you're going to try to subtly cast the spell, it would be obvious to people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he'll be doing it subtly, but it's the only part of it is verbal. So, okay, all right. Um, we'll still, we'll still. It's not really a sleight of hand. Call it a deception check to try to make it look like you're just part of mm-hmm. the chanting that's going on. So we'll do that when the reaction comes up. Yep. So Medric. Um, right. You have been, you have done this a couple of times. I will give you another opportunity if there's, you think there's something else you might be able to pick up about what's going on and make a roll to see if you can figure something out. Uh, this time, the only, the, the, the only thing I can think of is insight. But uh, you've already you've already done one insight yeah. check, so I don't think that that's not going to yield anything different. Uh, again, you could make uh, a, like a nature roll or. Any any skill you feel might give uh, Medric some insight here, besides insight, ironically enough, uh, I would allow if you can make a case for it. Um, this time, the the uh, the ferret is kind of kind of dancing around the cup, like inside, just sort of hopping around, and it's kind of almost seeming like it's reacting to the crowd, the crowd chanting Phoenix, and it's kind of like turning around and turning around and turning around in that way that animals sometimes get uh, fixated on. 
I'll ask the uh, what is it like the the Barker the Ringer? What's the mm-hmm. word for it? The lady who owns the ferret. I've just called her Barker. Okay, I'll ask her. Um, where did you get that ferret? It looks pretty smart. Like to be twisting and not getting hurt like that, you know. It's one of the smartest creatures I've ever met, including some of my husbands. <laughs> and can I do an insight check on her? Sure can. Turns out it is one of her husbands. <laughs> <laughs> Eleven. Eleven? I mean, for a moment, there is that thought. Maybe it is one of her husbands. Wait, she turned one of her husbands into a ferret? Or did she marry a ferret? What did she mean by that? And there's just sort of a moment of, of, I don't know how to take that. (laughs) All right, last try. So uh, six and a half cranks. Use that little thing in the center to aim it. Okay. And try to intimidate the ferret again. All right, let's make an athletics check. This time, make it with, uh, with actually, no, not with advantage, because Annie's advice was bizarre, and you're not really sure if it was, like, more cranking or less cranking or if it was a precise number of cranks. So, yes. I'm assuming uh, by a thingy she meant the crank. <laughs> it could be, maybe. Um, so, athletics check, then? Ah, 14. Uh, 14? Okay. Could be better, but- it could be better. You're thinking you probably could have ranked, uh, uh, rung out a couple of more twists in it, but you're pretty sure that it's at least as tight as the first time. Pretty much. You go to aim. Do this an extra time crank. The, uh, <laughs> this time, do an extra crank? Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it cranks pretty easily. Um, then you can hear the, and you also notice that when you take that extra crank, the clicking noise stopped and then restarted. So okay. it is, it is, it is clearly starting the countdown after whatever the last crank is, which is why uh, Marigold could take a couple of seconds, regather himself, right, then then continue on without having to worry about it uh, ha- happening halfway through a crank. Um, okay. But you managed to get it pretty well cranked. You're pretty sure. This time the ferret is continuing its sort of bobbing, bouncing turn around the top of it, meaning that the whole thing is shifting ever so slightly. Go ahead and make your perception aim check at disadvantage. Don't I get to intimidate it first? You want to try doing that again? Yep. Okay. It's basically a I really s- quick I splash with fire again. I know what you're doing. I'll whisper to it. <laughs> All right. I can't. And just after his intimidation check, I don't want to interrupt that. This is when Silas will do his thing, actually. Okay. Uh, it seems to be used to this trick of yours with the flashing of the, of the eyes and seen it once. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, not going to happen. <laughs> and it seems to be unstopping. And so when it's kind of bobbing and weaving, the whole thing is shaking ever so slightly, making it a little bit harder to, to aim. Um, Silas is releasing a spell. Yes, uh, he is casting command from the staff. Now this will not work if the weasel is or if the ferret is undead, if it does not understand common, or if the command is directly harmful to it. In order the to command- do that, it does have to hear you. Yes, so you'd have to do this very, very loudly. Mm-hmm. It's got a range of sixty feet. So yeah, he, but it'll uh, be very, he will- very obvious that you're doing it, basically. Mm-hmm. Okay. He's just going to say, freeze. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is the uh, save on that? Wisdom. Oh, wisdom. <laughs> okay. Uh, sure. Let's see. A uh, nine. <laughs> so uh, as you're kind of uh, flashing your eyes to intimidate it, first you think it doesn't really work. And then you hear your friend over on the other side uh, yell out, Freeze. And the creature kind of halts, awkwardly kind of balancing uh, on the edge of this cup. It hasn't settled down, uh, but it has, uh, it has stopped. You can go ahead and make your aim now with, uh, without, uh, uh, without uh, disadvantage. Disadvantage. Probably. Perfect. There you go. Can I still line it up with the center of the thing I noticed last time? Uh, you can, you can, uh, it didn't work exactly like you thought it was going to last time, but, um, go ahead and make your, your roll. It'll be slightly easier. Um, Fuck. Although, um, like 
the dice are just horrible tonight. Maybe it's because the thing was kind of slightly off to one side. It had been caught mid-bounce and sort of like flump landed as a solid rock on the top. But then you hear the clicking turn over and the thing launches. This time you hear a bit of a cry out from the barker as you all watch and realize it's not moving at all. It's still locked in that same position it was when on top of the cup, flying through the air. This time it goes a little bit higher and you can see that it does crest over where the people's heads were. So you did get that extra crank in that did seem to work, but it's not moving. It's not stretching itself out. It's not uh, doing anything at the moment. And Mage Hand. Uh, did you have it cast already? Because mm. you used your reaction to do the other thing. So unless you had Mage Hand already up, it wouldn't be able to do it as a... Well, te command technically happens on its next turn. So I was trying to wait until basically its yeah. action was coming up. You... you as we said, we, you, you held your reaction. So you had mm -hmm. your turn, you held a reaction, reaction went off, no longer your turn. It's someone else's turn, technically Medric's turn. Mm-hmm. Okay, yep, yeah, that's fine. Okay. The crowd kind of goes quiet as they see this, and there's a cry out in that quiet from the barker. No! Leopold! As it goes off to the left. But with enough force that it does land in a big pile of the hay just outside the first rung. Oh. And for a second, nobody sees anything as it disappears quickly into the pile. And the Barker runs over to the edge, uh, lands onto her knees, starts sweeping away the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, straw that's there and lets out a deep breath. Ah, oh, there you are. And you hear this very angry kind of snittery, uh, animalistic sound as it's, as you hear this sort of thing. Uh, you can't see it just yet, still kind of caught up in the straw as it sort of uh, cries out uh, angrily at whatever the hell just happened to it. Uh, and she gingerly picks it up. It kind of runs up her arm onto her shoulders. And there's a cry of a cheer that goes up. And people have kind of forgotten that Medrick missed. They're just happy to see that the... the, uh, the the little critter critter is, is uh, doing okay. Although it's kind of hiding behind her head at the moment and kind of keeping eyes out, looking primarily at Medric, but then also trying to scan the crowd for wherever that voice came from. I'm afraid that's a little bit too much for the day. My little friend is tired and going to have to take a break. Thank you so much for your challenges. And come back oh, again man, tomorrow. You, you don't have any more ferrets? I was hoping to try again. There is no ferret like Leopold. And she smiles and gives you a wink and hands out a little treat right. to, to the critter. Try again tomorrow, then. And the crowd kind of... Thanks for the game. ...raises a, a, a clap. And even as they're starting to move away and they're clapping and everything there, there's still a, a little chant that goes up for, a, you know, a few temps. It gets a little bit half-hearted halfway of, of Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix. And then it kind of, yeah, fades out as everybody kind of disperses in their different directions. And uh, you can see that, that uh, the Barker is kind of attending to Leopold, um, kind of brushing back its fur and pulls out a tiny little brush and starts to actually brush it out uh, while feeding it treats with the other hand. It sort of half coils around her arm very affectionately, but also a little bit, a little bit frazzled. Um, you know, you don't have to be an animal uh, trainer to know that that's not what it expected to do. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's got a certain routine. It sticks to that routine, but that doesn't seem to, to have worked. Okay, Nikki, let's go get you some funnel cakes. Sugar. I'll, re I'll rejoin my friend. Okay. So what did you guys think of that ferret? There's something weird with it. Oh, yeah. The game is rigged. They're so probably all rigged, rigged. except point? for the one that Annie was in. That one was just stupidly difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was fun, though. 
Well, there's axe throwing competitions and archery competitions, so so clearly those can't be rigged. One would think. Uh, I'm pretty sure they can be. The uh, dunking booth was rigged, and there wasn't even prizes for that. <laughs> huh. I mean, if you're you're using provided axes and and arrows, then yeah, definitely can be. What about the uh, emu bucking? Like, uh, no question to the GM, is that kind of like the, like, you, you sit on an emu and they, it tries to throw you off and you have to, like, see how long you last? Or? That's what you presume it is from the name. Okay. Mm, I don't know. Like I said, I mean, Annie's wasn't rigged, so they're not all rigged, but everything else we've tried has been. I'm sure they're inventive. So um. you find a, a funnel cake for uh, young Nikki, who grabs it with both hands, kind of dispensing with the small amount of uh, yeah, yeah, wouldn't yeah. There'd be a little bit of paper, I guess, that they would have. It's a very crude kind of paper, but he kind of throws it aside and just grabs the thing with both hands. There's <laughs> honey everywhere. Even more sticky than before. <laughs> he offers some to you briefly. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll have some. It's like, hmm. By the way, I just looked up funnel cake. Not at all what I thought it was. No, it's it's not really a funnel, which is kind of the weirdest thing. It's basically a, a dough that they spread over some bur some boiling oil, and it cooks very quickly into a flat. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, a safe, I was uh, expecting surface. a cake. Nope. I got to look it up. It, it, it's often put in a funnel and like drizzled over hot oil, so it's like yep. zigzaggy. Yeah. Yeah, um, it is made using a funnel. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, in this case, they finish it with a bit of of, uh, of honey um, as their as their the primary topping. At least this one did. I had no Cinnamon idea sugar is the best. <laughs> mm. And I will be cleaning off uh, Nikki as he eats. Right. He seems completely unconcerned with this. <laughs> the like lick the napkin and <laughs> no, just with. Mm, prestidigitation. <laughs> yeah, it's for a little while. It's hard to keep up with him uh, as he finds new mm -hmm. ways to get more sticky. Uh, and of course, the funnel cake itself still has honey on it, so it's sort of like, oh, my hand is clean now. Grab, lick the hand, <laughs> uh, and then use it to steady himself on on uh, on your uh, your hip. But um, there are more games to be had. Some of them seem to be difficult. You have faced off a couple of couple of games, which there seems to be some sort of some sort of thing to them. Medrick, as you're thinking back, um, the in that one in particular, the ferret isn't just a dumb cannonball, but in no. fact does react to what's going on, and seems to be playing its own game. Whether that was intended by the uh, by the dwarven barker or not, the ferret is having its own fun. I mean, it would have to be. It's being yeeted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if I thought of that, I could have called it ferret yeeting or something, but yeet the ferret. And the fact that uh, the barker like really cares about it and hasn't gave it a name, and yeah. Yeah, the fact that it's called Leopold gets you back to your theory about maybe it is one of her husbands. Yeah. <laughs> Polymorphed. <laughs> it can be permanent. Or it's a friendly druid. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so if I can, uh, we, we, if we can, we should keep an eye on her and on the ferret to see if it, like anything weird happens, I guess. Well, the ferret was throwing off your aim. I mean, it was in on it. Yeah, that one, that much was obvious. The ferret was in on it. If but, I've done nothing else today, I've introduced that potential. Mm, the, uh, I mean, the axe throwing Fringeful would be ferret. good for you. Yeah. Axe throwing, emu bucking, possibly. Have you ridden animals much? Horses. Have you had a Easy time staying on them while you were fighting. <laughs> In general, I mean, 
Well, the horses we ride were trained for battle, so I guess it's possibly different. Mm. The emus are probably raised to throw you off. Yes, considering how rigged this carnival is, that would not surprise me. Yeah, well, I don't know if the emu one necessarily has to be rigged. It's just going to be hard. Yeah. But I will be eager to watch. I'll hand you over another ticket. Do whatever you want. Playing yet, but. I mean, I'm kind of interested in the uh, the bluffing game. Cool. I figure, like after that round with the ferret, we'd just be like walking around a bit. Yep. Trying to figure out which other game to play. And you can see mm -hmm. uh, there's a number of betting games, um, simple betting games, uh, Crown and Anchor, um, with the crown of uh, of Alaria, the symbol of the crown of Alaria painted in where the crown is on it. Um, Annie, you, you kind of take a side eye to that and realize that it probably was recently painted. <laughs> Uh, did we notice if the museum required these tickets to get in? It is one ticket to get in, yes. Okay. I'll make sure to save some then. Okay. All right, the museum. So, uh, you've mentioned the uh, emu bucking and the bluffing game, and of course the museum as well. What would you like to do next as you're wandering around? Uh you kind of get the squirmy feeling from uh, Nikki that he doesn't want to be held for much longer. The sugar is starting to kick in. <laughs> yep. Let's say, uh, Nikki, stay close to us, and I'll let him down the ground, and then I'll just follow wherever he goes. Yeah, he uh, starts that's going. Probably not a good way. idea. <laughs> uh, the the alignment your son has is chaotic everywhere right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Every single booth, every single uh, act, there's some jugglers. He's kind of walks right into the juggler. The juggler stum somehow manages. Well, let's see if the juggler manages to keep his juggling going well. Actually, okay, I will have a mage Nikki. hand up to grab Nikki should uh, it be required. <laughs> okay. Uh, the the like, you know? magician's like child backpack with a, with a <laughs> leash. <laughs> Yeah, it'll just sit there. A wand of child control. Yeah, it'll just sit there on his shoulder and occasionally pull back. Um, as he kind of approaches the juggler, he tries to grab one of the the balls in midair, and the juggler kind of lets him grab one and toss it up. Somehow managing to make that part of his routine. There's a little bit of a of a crowd that cheers as as uh, Nikki starts to participate. Um, why don't you go ahead and roll uh, me a, a a an acrobatics or an athletics check from Nikki? Uh, I'm assuming he probably has a four or five, uh, no, actually probably six or seven de dexterity. So minus two. Okay. As the juggler's kind of dancing around 14. a little bit. Okay. Uh, and, and he, he manages, your, your son manages quite competently to kind of toss it in at just the right time. Uh, or at least the juggler made it look like it was the right time. You can tell he's pretty good at, at this and working the crowd. Uh, and after a few minutes, uh, Nikki has kind of gotten a bit of the energy worn out of him. Uh, and, uh, after the juggler catches the last of, of the, of the balls they're juggling, they bow to the applause of the, uh, the, uh, crowd. He uh, hands Nikki one of the small uh, uh, balls that he's using. It's basically a, a cloth ball with a bit of sand inside uh, for him to keep. Uh, and then the the um, the juggler puts out a uh, a hat quite uh, elegantly and starts to collect from the crowd. Uh, as uh, he comes around, and it's a fairly slim, uh, probably a half elf, um, somewhat pointed ears, not super prominent, but uh, somewhat fairly thin, dressed head to toe in this sort of stretchy white outfit with little uh, red stars along the edges. As he puts the, the hat out in front of you, uh, you, you get a, a, a wink, a nod and an acknowledgement from him. Probably, um, well, actually make an insight check. 
as you try to interpret what this this uh, person is trying to to uh, to communicate. Twelve. Uh, at least part of it is is uh, uh, you know your son did well, not verbalized. Also, you're welcome because your son does look a little more tired than he did just a couple of minutes ago. Kind of worked out a bit of the energy he had inside him, uh, and then. There's something more, which is probably just, but I could use a tip. Um, um, well, Silas will give him a couple of spare coins uh, and a look that says, uh, you're welcome. Uh, or sorry, uh, thank you for tiring him out. You're welcome for letting him, letting, uh, letting you use him in the act. <laughs> Because little kid will mean more coins. It, 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 <laughs> that is the thing that exists. <laughs> not wrong. As a fellow entertainer, you know exactly that uh, children can often uh, be uh, be additional props. Uh, and uh, but you get the impression that uh, hyperactive children who have had too much sugar are probably very commonly encountered here. So he knew exactly kind of how to handle that uh, and uh, managed to make your son feel like a star for a moment as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but, we speak uh, in entertainers camp. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to write that down. Entertainers camp. <laughs> All right. There's a language they probably do have. Uh, they'd have Carney. But Silas yeah. wouldn't. Yep. Yeah. No, they, they definitely have their different signals and, and terms within, within the organization, if you will. Um, so with a somewhat more uh, sed uh, sedate child now, kind of, he's, he doesn't really want to be held, but he doesn't really want to move that far either. So he's kind of hanging onto your leg most of the time for, for, at the moment. Um, what are the rest of you seeking out for entertainment? Uh, I'll go to the, the no see -um. See what that's about. Yeah, I'll follow any there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Did you say no see -um? I'm kind of wondering what that's about too. No, see him. Yeah, that's yeah. what you. That's One what you write. The, list. the bluffing game. Oh, I I had it listed as the bluffing game. I I had. <laughs> I think I had typed it to you guys differently than what I'd actually uh, written down here, but that's fine. Uh, oh yeah, no, see him. Yes, I I. The the trouble with coming up with a good pun, after you've written your notes, <laughs> and forgetting to push it back in your notes. Yes. Uh, there we go. No see him. All right. So, um, the no see him turns out to be some sort of card game. You have one dealer who's standing, uh, behind a, uh, a kind of a, 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 we're standing in rather a cloth booth with a, a, uh, uh, uh banner, banner, banister in front of him, a nice wide space. And there's multiple squares where cards are going down. looks like you can take up to four people at the same time. So there are, um, there's only one person there at the moment. You all could play, um, or you could only one play depends on what you want to do. Uh, basically he welcomes you up, uh, just about to start another round. If anyone thinks they're smarter than me, I'll, I might as well join in. Okay. Um, it's a, uh, a, a, a dark skinned male, um, uh, probably also again, a half elf, but you only kind of notice the, the small amount. There's a sort of way that the eyebrows and the brow line kind of runs. And then there's a, just a tilt to the ears, not even really, a a, 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 a full point. Um, but there's something in the manner of the person as well. You also realize that they're wearing stage makeup and kind of meant to look a little more intimidating, perhaps, to the common person. Um, so Annie sitting down, or Medrick and Silas sitting this out, or are you two getting involved? I'm going to sit the first one out just to see how it works, because I have no idea like what the rules are for that game. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Silas is going to focus on figure uh, trying to figure out what's going on and where the cheat is. Okay. Um, so the other two seats fill up. In fact, it looks like you need four to actually run the game. And he starts to shuffle the cards, uh, you know, fairly adept at, at, at shuffling, doing a couple of fancy spreads and splits and turns and all that sort of thing. 
So the rules of the game are fairly simple. All you have to do is convince me that your card is better than mine, and I'm going to try to convince you of the same. If we are convinced, we will uh, stake our bet. And if we are bet wrong, then we lose our bet. If we bet right, then we win. Simple as that. Seems relatively straightforward. Um, deals out one card to each of you and a card for himself, face down. You're free to look at your cards. And I need to get a good random... I just realized I should have some random cards in front of me, but I don't have them. Uh, random card... Uh, generator. Look for one live. Random dark... Uh, oh, here we go. Just a clarification. Uh, mm -hmm. By better, is it higher or lower? Uh, higher would be what would higher. be better. Uh, and aces are the high of this particular suit. Uh, a little bit different. Okay. So I need to... Whoops. Okay. Well, that works, but I need to draw five cards. All right. Um, roll me a D... Actually, no, it's completely random. So the first card you pull up, and I'm just going to use standard card um, uh, names and letters and numbers because and colors because we're used to those. But there is a kind of card in World uh, of Omatia. I just don't have the full thing in front of me. I should have probably done that. Uh, you draw a King of Clubs as your first card, Annie. Cool. And part of this you realize, and it was sort of implied there, but I, I misspoke, is whoever believes they have the highest card of all four, or all five, I should say. Um, so you have to be better than the dealer and better than the other three. So you have to figure out how to read them. Sorry, there are, did I get that right? Yes, four players, so plus the dealer. Four players and the dealer. Yep. Uh, so you... Take a look at your card. You notice the dealer has not looked at their card. And the dealer turns to the first person. So, do you have a better card than me? And you see them doubly look at their card. Uh, actually, I need to do that in a private role. Uh, does the type of card it is matter? Is like, for example, it's like an ace better than a heart or whatever ace at the top so it's inverted from the normal I mean, not ace, uh, is it a spade think, better than a diamond yeah spade one that's uh, shaped was, like an <laughs> there was no mention of whether suits were involved so you, okay so that's what i was suits looking are for. equivalent so it's okay. possible that everybody could have uh well it's possible that four people could have the same card of different suits uh and believe they are the winner there's no uh the, what would be happening on a push uh, on a push, um, the bets stand for the next round. push? Push is when uh, you both believe you have the highest and you have the same. Okay. But your, and your card is higher than anybody else's. So the bets stand, which means it gets more complicated in the second round. Uh, it was one ticket to play. Yep. Uh, okay. I've marked uh, it down. I forget how to do... Pardon me. Uh, it's working either. Uh, if I want to roll without anybody seeing it, um, you can go in like you know the dice roller on the like toolbar. Right. Uh, you can press, I believe it's GM, so that only you can see it. Oh, okay. So like, see if this works. I just rolled, so nobody else should be able to see that roll, other than. Right. And did you see that roll? I, I did see that one, yeah. yeah. That right. I saw so yours, I did not see hers. Okay, so it didn't work for me. So you uh, want it to be filled in in blue. Okay, did you see that one? If you just rolled something that wasn't that one, then okay. no. Perfect. So I can do a few private rolls without having to, to do that. All right. So what I'm going to do is just roll all four of them. This is a game Zacchaeus would be good at. It's like, all right, let's play. Arcane Eye just floats around and looks at everybody's cards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so the first person says, yes, my card is higher than yours. You can make a uh, an insight check, Annie. Uh, that is a 14. 14? Seems legit. Was telling the truth. Basically, after each of them, you'll be rolling, and then you get to roll your deception at the very end to determine whether you are better than this person. Uh, second one says, no, my card is lower. Now, if their card is actually higher, they will win. But the other person could concede and say, well, my card is lower. I so, see. Insight check? I feel like this, this is a game we should play in real life at some point. <laughs> <laughs> It'll need a uh, lot more refinement than that. That is an 18. 18? They're lying. They believe their card is higher. Okay. Third person. Uh, I mean, I think it's higher. Eight. They're definitely uncertain. You're not sure whether they're right or wrong. And you're not sure if the uncertainty that they were doing was an act. They're hard to read, weirdly enough, for being so nervous. Now, you can use deception. Or you can use persuasion. Let me know which um, one it is. Uh, deception is you are lying. Persuasion is that you are telling the truth, but you want them to be confused about it. I will use persuasion. Okay. Okay. Uh, that is a 19. A 19. Okay. Well, my uh, card that, is... Yes. Yes, it is higher. Okay. Um, it looks at you for a second or two, smiles, looks out over the rest. And my card is lower. And you all reveal your cards. You turn over your king of clubs. Or sorry, king of spades, I should say. Uh, is it clubs? No, it is clubs. I, I wrote clubs. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. I, it was small on my screen, and it was hard to tell the difference. Uh, yeah. And reveal that beside you, the person had a seven of spades. They were in. Uh, they were uncertain as to whether they were higher or lower. They were actually lower. The one beside that said uh, that they were higher. They have an eight of hearts. The one on the very end, who was very confident, was completely lying. They had a two of diamonds. <laughs> and then the dealer turns over his card. He's got a four of diamonds. His card is lower. So you win the round and you win the other person's money. So you hey. get three uh, prizes. Nice. As simple as that. So three prizes. Yep. Now, if you want to go another hand, you can stake your three or we can part company. And that's when you realize that when you start playing the game, you can't stop unless you walk away. If you stop for the day, you take your prizes or your debts and go. The other three step down. <laughs> and it's like, I don't understand how this game works. I'll go for now. I I'm content with three prizes. That that gives me. Is it like three three prize tokens? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm content with three prize tokens. Okay. The, the she's dealer, not the... much into the, this this gambling thing. Yeah. To be fair, yep. but she's just really good at lying. <laughs> okay. The uh, the the dealer bids you adieu, and as you uh, or bids you good day, not adieu because there's no French. Uh, as you uh, hands over the prize tokens, which were essentially exchanged for the uh, the uh, tickets that they were given as well, and as you step away, you realize the dealer staked nothing in that particular game. That didn't cost them anything and gained them at least one. Yep. That may be their winning strategy. Yep. All right. Maybe the game isn't scammy, but the person is. <laughs> So you have your three pious tokens in, in hand. You do see a prize uh, token vendor 
not too far, or not a token vendor rather, but a prize vendor where you can mm -hmm. exchange tokens nearby. Uh, this one seems to be a uh, a blue-skinned, long blue-haired triton, uh, a, a woman uh, who uh, um, seems to be smiling wide to all the crowd nearby uh, and welcoming you to exchange exchange your tokens here for the beautiful prizes of the seas. And each of the different uh, vendors, just so that you know, does have different things that they have available to them. They're mm -hmm. in broad parts of the city, though, so um, it they you can check them all, but it will take most of the day to get between them all. They're strategically laid out so that you can't just do price shopping or, or uh, not price shopping, but prize shopping uh, easily. And you can uh, see so what does she have here? Welcome, welcome. You have done well today, yes? Oh, fairly well. Um, and just got to bring hers up. Okay. Well, let me offer you the beauties of the seas. I have these few things for um, everyday use, especially here in this beautiful town along the waters. This, for example, and she holds up a small, um, well, opens up a can, first of all, a sort of a canister made of, of wood that seemed to have been sealed on the inside so it wouldn't get wet. And inside you see a pack of uh, what look like small uh, gel-like candies. These are made from a particular squid. That squid's uh, body is amazing. If you were to find it in the waters itself, you could eat of its flesh and breathe freely for a while. But it's very difficult to find, and you never know if you're going to find one right away. So we, in our bounty and joy, have found them and found a way to take the flesh of the squid and turn it into these what we refer to as air bubbles. When you eat something of this, you gain a full lung of breath. Very popular among pearl divers. And you can imagine that here in particular, that would be a prize that a lot of people would actually really appreciate. Uh, but I see you are a more discerning buyer. Perhaps you like to fish, yes? I've, I don't do much fishing personally. Ah, uh, well, perhaps you have a bow who fishes, yes? And kind of looking over and seeing Silas and Medrick, perhaps one of them wishes to fish. She, she has a bow, them, like... And you wish to give them a, a gift. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, as in a, a, a lover, someone who you are close to. I'm not oh. here. Oh, well, this could be one way to get one. There are many fishers down by the waters, and they would all appreciate such a thing. And she pulls Patrick up. is just like silently cringing. <laughs> she pulls up. Uh, it's on a, a leather thong at the moment, kind of hanging, but um, it's a piece of metal. And it looks like a fairly small, thin piece of metal with uh, which branches off into three points. Uh, this is a fish hook, but not an everyday fish hook, because we know the powers of such simple metals can be harnessed. All you need to do is utter a special phrase. And she kind of whispers it in, in the language of the Tritons. You're familiar with the language, even though you don't know it. And it's a simple word. Um, you're not sure what the word actually means. And you see that the, the metal glows ever so slightly. And then the three fingers curl up. This is a fish hook that will bait itself with anything. And it is strong. Once it is hooked on to a fish, you can reel it in. No matter the size of the fish, it will help you if you wish to hunt for sharks or help you if you wish to hunt for whales, although you might need a bigger boat. These are only one voucher. Or hunt for sea devils. <laughs> well, it could be used to hunt for people if you are so inclined. 
also your bait will be automatically struck like this. And she reaches in uh, behind and there's a sort of bloop sound. Uh, she must have stuck her hand into some bucket of water or something, pulls out a little wriggling worm, lays it across, uh, says the word again, the, the, the hook straightens, lays it across the, the, uh, the top, says the word again. And this time, rather than gently, it snaps shut, holding on to the worm, which wriggles but then is unable to pull free. Very, very tightly hooked. I have heard of these being used elsewhere, but I know fish. But I see you are not yet impressed. How about this? And she uh, pulls out a candle. It does not look like much, yes? No? It does not look like much. A uh, friend, and she gestures towards Medric. I hear you are adept with flame. Would you care to start this candle? Sure. Well, can't you produce flame? Just... Okay. And the candle burns quite brightly. It has a, a weird bluish kind of glow. And the flame doesn't flicker based on the, the, the air around, but seems to almost swoosh back and forth very gently, very rhythmically. Now, she puts the candle down, kind of sets it there. This candle, it burns well. It gives you bright light, but not just here. And she reaches over, pulls up, this time a tub of water. And you can see that the the worms are squiggling around in the bottom of it. There's quite a few. She does that demonstration probably dozens of times every day. Takes the candle. Aha! Throws it into the water. And you watch as the candle lands, continues to burn under the water. In fact, seems to burn even more brightly in water. These candles are made from the flesh of a particular whale. You melt it down. And because it is such of a nature of the water, it will continue to thrive in the water. These candles of the deep will last you for many hours, but since they are more difficult to produce and we have a limited number, it will take you two tokens. Um, Could those be mass produced? We do produce many of them. But there are only so many whales. Large version. Or a larger version. Yes, I think it could be done. We could make one that is the whole of a whale. But I do not know what we would wish to light except an entire kingdom. And alas, I have not seen my kingdom in some time. It is long since lost. Well, that's unfortunate. What happened to it? Oh, it is a tragic tale for another day. But uh, let us just say that there are more creatures in the sea than us peace and loving ones, and those desired oh. more room. We've noticed. <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, Edric is just thinking, it's like, what if we could bring Ing- Ignis to light, light up the, all of the underwater areas? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't I mean, say it, but he's thinking it. That, that's the ultimate proselytization, bring sunlight to the places that don't have sun. Exactly. Uh, she demonstrates a few other things. Um, I won't go through each particular one. They're all um, very clearly aimed at uh, people who work in the fishing industry for the most part. They might be of some interest to Silas. Um, she pulls out a, uh, a slender pole. Uh, it's about five feet long, and you can see it's doubled over. When she straightens the pole out um, at, uh, at one end, uh, it kind of grows a few leaves that turn and twist, forming, uh, forming a, almost a, a, a branch around the back. And you can see little, little flowers sprout along the edges of it uh, and kind of curl back in on themselves. Uh, and then she demonstrates as she pulls some, some uh, line, it is a fishing pole um, that essentially is an organic fishing pole that will fold itself out. Uh, and bends down to a simple pole of five feet long. Um, that's for two tokens. Um, she does offer, she has a, a, a weird looking uh, little small bottle, um, which has what looks like kelp growing in the bottle. It's kind of uh, a, a murky liquid. Um, she has a few potions of water breathing available. Again, you can see where she's targeting the people uh, by the shore. And uh, finally... Um, she brings out 
what looks to be almost like a translucent pearl, but it's massive. Um, it is literally like a foot and a half wide uh, or radius, uh, or that's not radius, uh, diameter uh, uh, sphere, like a hollowed out pearl. I do not need this, for I am naturally of the sea. But if you were to put this on your head, you could breathe as much as you wish, for it naturally replenishes itself. And she kind of demonstrates by looking to put it on top of, of Annie's head. Does Annie allow it? Yeah. Okay. Um, she puts it over your head and it's foggy for a moment and then starts to clear. And you can feel sort of air being driven in from the top of this kind of flowing around you. It has a, a kind of salty smell to the air, uh, but otherwise uh, is perfectly breathable. I have straps to hold it down if you wish. And you can see that there's sort of basically a strapping mechanism that would attach this and kind of run underneath your armpits to hold it down. Uh, effectively, it's a diving bell or a diving helmet, uh, but it, it indefinitely generates its own air. Um, hmm. Uh, Would you like to cosplay Mysterio in Amasia? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's called a breathing bubble. Cool. And that one is only three tokens. If nothing here captures your inspiration, if, unlike many people here, you do not wish to catch the fish of a lifetime, I understand. Not everyone is in love with the sea as I am naturally born to be, but I would tell you, these are good goods. And if you find others who are interested in such things, it would be of my utmost thanks for you to tell them of this. These are definitely quite interesting. I just unfortunately am uh, part of the people who like saying on land. Same. And you, friend, pointing towards Silas, you look to be a man of the sea. Silas is still back at the card place. Oh, okay. You didn't go with him. All right. No, I still had some questions. Oh, okay. Well, um, she looks, uh, you know, understandably disappointed, but at the same time, understanding. I, I don't it's swim much. <laughs> it's uh, Lyranotha, the Triton. But I definitely oh. will send people this way if they're looking for for things that will make water easier. That is much appreciated. You know, I hear that too many people die when they fall over ships. It would be a shame for more people to die without my goods on hand. Definitely would be a shame. Mm -hmm. um, so Silas was at the card game asking questions, or...? Yeah, well, he had been watching her uh, play. Mm -hmm. uh, he was looking to see if there was a cheat involved. Okay. I don't think there was, but... Uh, um, let's call that... Hmm. Are you proficient with uh, any sort of gambling um, tools, I guess they're called? No. No, he just has, like, investigation insight that sort of stuff. He's not proficient with them, but... Okay. Um, investigation would be watching a few hands roll by. You could do that. Or insight would be just kind of watching a single hand. Or watching them, really. Yeah, well, he would have watched the whole uh, thing. Uh, and in fact, he's actually probably going to stay here and watch a few hands. Uh, but he's going to walk away for a bit and then cast Detect Magic and then come back uh, and just watch as it goes on for 10 minutes just to see if there's anything magical involved or if it's a straight-up game. Okay. Um, so I, whatever they do, he's going to be here for a bit watching this. Sure, sure. Uh, well, the, the, the full spiel that, uh, that uh, she was giving would have taken enough time for you to have some, some chances to, to observe what's going on. Um, uh, let's have you make... Um, let's call it an investigation role. And that's kind of representing looking at things. Um, okay. Is this like a like standard like card game 
that someone who's proficient in card playing cards would know? Uh, it's not a commonly known game, but someone who has, is proficient in it could roll to see if they know, essentially. Could Are I? Are you proficient with card games? I, I should I have asked that before. Okay, mm -hmm. yes, you can go ahead and roll. Playing yeah, card sets. That. Uh, that is a natural 19, so okay. with proficiency and all that, that would just be a 22 before whatever stat. Okay. Uh, so, Annie, uh, it is a little bit of an unusual game. It is a weird bluffing game um, where you get the the reason why they needed four people to participate is so that the house doesn't pay out very much. Uh, if the house loses the deception, that's the only time they're going to pay out. Um, the fact that he doesn't look at his own card is a little bit strange. Uh, and you get the impression that it's nothing about the cards. It's about the deception. Uh, and he's reading people uh, each time. Uh, and when he can't read someone, he will be very carefully uh, able to capitulate. But there is a bit of skill. If you play multiple hands, cards start to get eliminated, and then you can start to play some numbers and angles. Uh, and that's also where the betting starts to get really dangerous, because each time you're risking um, whatever you have, but you also potentially can get a lot more. So it gets very, very quickly uh, very expensive to play if you're not careful. The other three that were with you, one of them did seem to be a decent bluffer, uh, but he didn't have the card to back it up. Uh, and the other two were trying to bluff, but they didn't have the cards either, and they should have just folded. Uh, and yeah. then it would have been a push. Um, and you think at that point the house might have been forced to say they had the higher card just to make sure that there was no easy win, but they decided not to. Um the full dynamics would take some time, but it's a it's a it's a bluffing game, uh, kind of like a one round poker game. Uh, oh. Silas, as you're observing this, and later on when you come back with the tech magic activated, and you're kind of seeing the world through the 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 lens of of light, uh, Nikki's kind of uh, a little bit sleepy at this point and just kind of getting dragged dragged around. You get a feeling that he's probably done for the day. Uh, and if he doesn't get back home, he's going to get pretty cranky at some point. So you might want to either take mm -hmm. him home or take the parents to, to get him home. But as he's up on my shoulder right now. Uh, yeah, he's kind of flopping around a little bit. He's kind of leaning heavily on your head. And every once in a while, you kind of have to make sure you're leaning the right way so he doesn't fall off. Um, but you, you look around, and with the Detect Magic up, you do detect a lot of different little bits of magic here and there. Um, some of the tents have some basic enchantments. Uh, some of the, the uh, people walking around have basic enchantments as well. Um, but strangely enough, this person does not have any enchantments or enchantment tented items. The cards themselves are stock standard. They themselves uh, have no apparent spells active and don't have any magic items. Um, you, As you're watching, you kind of get this sense that uh, they are in it for the thrill. Um, and while they don't look at their cards uh, ahead of time, or at least you don't think they do, they are most definitely doing some deck manipulation. Um, so they're probably pretty much aware. But even, even then, as you're watching, uh, the deck manipulation is probably really, really subtle. And it still leaves a certain amount up to chance, weirdly enough. Because unless you're missing how good they are, um, they only do half the deck manipulation you might expect. So most but of the I do of see, hand, I do see that they're they're like dealing from the bottom of the deck occasionally or something. Something like that. It's more like they're 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 limiting the set of cards that can go out, but they still don't know where the cards go. So they're they're kind of they're they're dealing a subset of the deck rather than the full deck. Okay. And if someone ends up getting a low card, they can't win no matter how good a bluffer they are. They can if the others all back down. So but they nobody, I, Do people, I, in other hands, I, in, that, in the one she was in, nobody backed down. Right. Uh, but do some people back down in some of them? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and you see that over successive hands that some people get bullied over. Um, sometimes it's just 
because of the way that he asks the question it seems to unnerve them. It's like he's able to peer into them uh, and see that they were bluffing. In other cases, it's in the house does lose. He does lose uh, about a half of the hands, in fact. Um, but because he has so little stake in those initial hands, it doesn't cost mm-hmm. him much to lose, and he gains every time people play. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. No. Uh, Silas will just take Nikki home. Okay. Is Silas going to take Nikki home himself, or is he going to ask his parents to take him home? Um. Because there won't that depends really be on a completely to... unrelated question. Uh, <laughs> the pearl divers. Where do they do their pearl diver thing? Uh, usually way off the coast of, or the upper edge where the barony is of the, um, of the large ridge. I forget the name of it offhand. Oh, near um, the, near the castle. Uh, yes and no. It, the castle's up on a very high ridge. Yeah. Uh, and where that promontory is out in the water, that's kind of the deepest point that's still within fairly close part of land. It's not far away from, from a lot of where the, the family, your clan mm-hmm. actually does its, uh, its fishing as well. And there may be even some of the clan that does pearl diving, but it can be pretty risky if you're not careful. Uh, some of the more, mm-hmm. um, uh, enhanced of the clan certainly can do so, but there is contested water over there. They, it wouldn't be something where the clan can claim all that water. Okay. Um, um yeah, uh, Silas will let Annie and Medrick know that he's going to take Nikki home, uh, but he should be back. Uh, what time of day is it? It's getting to be evening. So early okay. evening, which for a, a, a young boy is, is pretty much bedtime. But mm-hmm. um, uh, So yeah, he'll, he, he's going to take Nikki back and he'll see them tomorrow. Okay. Nikki's tired. All right. Mm-hmm. Are you, so are you staying home too or coming back at all? or do we just? Well, if it's already evening, then by the time he, get, he takes Nikki home, and comes back, I don't know if there'd be much going on. Right, right. I forgot how far away it was. Yeah. There, there right, there's no cars in Omesha. <laughs> there are things going on later in the evening, but mostly it's it's uh, performances and, and uh, impromptu dances and things like that that are happening. More mm-hmm. than, and, and a lot of partying the bars at that point. Yeah. And how many days is it before Silas's performance? Uh, let me just quickly check. I believe I... it's still several days. Um, because it's the 17th, uh, the performances are on the 20th, the night before the party at the mansion, the festival Mm -hmm. itself continues on another week after that. Uh, but, uh, the 20th is when the, the actual, uh, challenge is, um, yeah, basically Silas will just, uh, head home and, uh, he uh, this will likely take place after whatever else Annie and Medrick are doing, but he does want to take a trip down to the Pearl Divers after he's dropped Nikki off, since they're not hugely far away. Well, there wouldn't be any Pearl Divers out that time of night. Okay, then he'll just go to bed. Okay. Well, uh, wake up early so he can then. try to talk to them in the morning. Yeah, the Pearl Divers probably head out pretty early um, to catch one of the tides. Um, so that they're Pearl Diving not quite as deep as they would normally. Yep. Uh, all right. Um, you uh, So Silas uh, uh, bids the them adieu. Actually, um, your parents are going to go with you. Uh, it looks as though your, your mm-hmm. father has been on his feet all day and is starting to wear out a little bit. Uh, and your mother has a, a bundle of things that she's picked up from different places across the... Uh, across the festival, um, including potentially a few for, for, uh, Nikki, but Nikki cool. by this point is already asleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, it is getting to be a little bit later. The museum is closed for the night uh, and the Griffin rides don't typically run this late as well. So there are a few games to participate in, uh, or you could take an early evening of it, do some relaxation and meditation if you wish. Meet up with Silas. Emu, emu, emu. <laughs> That'll be a tomorrow thing. Or I don't know. Should I? You're a muted. Uh, uh... Uh, and he's probably going to go to one of the parties. Just hang out, see see what people do. Okay. And what about Medrick? not drink? 
not not drink too much more than like one drink. Okay. Nedrick will So this is what a real party is, not a Oh yes. <laughs> how 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 is the, the land okay. going? <laughs> so uh, while Medric is is working on his thoughts for the evening, uh, it's not hard to find one of many parties going on. Uh, every every pub seems to be filled to overflowing, uh, both with the the locals, but also there are a fair amount of people that came to town uh, specifically uh, to follow the festival. Uh, and so there are a number of, of visitors here from all over, uh, certainly lots from Pitajun, but also from further afield, uh, definitely some from, from Icro, some from as far away as, as uh, probably were on a trade ship from the uh, Western Ulvip, the sea in the far west, uh, and heard about the party essentially and ended up kind of side sidelining their own travels. Uh, to come and stay into town. It's been come, it's one of those weird tourism moments that Aelthwater does not get. Uh, but now that there's this massive thing going on, this massive celebration, and then of course the people of the Circus Maximus, Maximus themselves uh, are definitely there. And there's a bit of taking the face paint off once uh, night falls. There are still performers, uh, some people who've been idle most of the day. Uh, they start to bring out their their uh, their equipment and perform for the people. But for the most part, most of the people that you've seen uh, at the uh, carnival, running the carnival, are now at the parties. Uh, and the pa- parties are loud, and they are raucous, and they are consuming a lot of alcohol. Um to the point where some of the some of the pubs are starting to mark off on the big chalkboard behind. We no longer have this. We no longer have this. We will have more of this tomorrow. There's a shipment coming in from Pit of June later. We're never getting this again. Uh, kind of thing on the bar, um, running down to almost the basest of ales and and uh, and uh, rums and whiskeys that they have available to them. Um, there's also a sense of celebration that hasn't been in this town for a while. Um, you've been here for a while and there are festivals, there are, uh, there are gatherings and they are pretty, uh, upbeat as well, but there's almost a more deliberate nature of this particular fest. There's more of a, of a sense of, of, uh, of getting out underneath a shadow for a lot from a long time. Make, uh, let's call this an insight check. Insider investigation. I guess which way would would she be uh, trying to to w- work through the crowd? You're muted. Probably insight. Uh, that's a seventeen plus one, so eighteen. Okay. Um. So there, there's definitely a lot of pent up need for joy that's happening at the moment. But you also notice that working through the crowd, some of the people you'd seen earlier uh, working the festival or working the circus, but also some people who you didn't see earlier, but having lived in this town, you kind of pick out as, that's not a local, that's not a local, that's not a local either. And they're going through and spurring the party on. Um, You've noticed them come into a room where people have started to quiet down a little bit. And they've maybe gotten a bit into their cups and they're kind of uh, tired for the evening. And they come in and they start to tell jokes or they start to engage or they start to tell a story or they ask for the stories of the locals and re-engage them, uh, kind of bringing the party back up um, to the point where once they leave, um, the, the room is, is, uh, is, is back up on their feet. There's lots of shouting and joy going on. People are back playing darts, whatever, whatever they're getting up to. Uh, and then they leave the room and you notice that they kind of sn- carefully sneak out through the side or through the back door. They don't necessarily leave through the front. It doesn't seem to be too sinister, but it's very deliberate. And you notice it because you're kind of sitting back and watching the crowd. They're just trying to get people to get drunk more. I mean, they could be working for the tourism industry. Uh, (laughs) Or they might be pickpockets. Who knows? (laughs) Yeah. As Uh, you... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, you you go ahead. Okay. (laughs) As you're kind of uh, keeping an eye on people and watching the crowds... 
you notice someone else, someone that just seems to move through the crowds without really interacting with them, someone who no one seems to really pay much attention to. Uh, they seem to be uh, about average height, average build, but unusually wearing a completely white cloak, unmarked with any uh, any uh, insignia, unmarked without any decoration, not even a, a belt to cinch it tight, but it does seem to be uh, fairly well-fitting, although the shape of the body underneath is, is, com- is hard to understand as well. And you see them kind White of is such a through. weird color to try to hide in. It really is. And you would think that they'd be making more of an impression, but nobody seems to notice as they kind of walk through and they pop into a space, look around, can and I'm, as they look... Can I try to make eye contact? Uh, you certainly can. Um, it's not hard because you, you can literally just look at them. Uh, and as you lock eyes, you notice that it looks to be a very pale elf with uh, dark hair underneath. Wearing They're wearing a hood as well, so that wasn't even you couldn't even tell. Uh, clean shaven, light blue eyes. Um, and as they kind of uh, look towards you, they kind of tilt their head slightly, a little smirk goes up, and they turn and leave without much more acknowledgement than that. Hmm. I don't follow. Okay. You don't I, follow, I, but I'm assuming you're going from a couple, to a couple of different places as the night goes on. Yeah. Okay. I, um, I, I don't go out on my own and purposefully follow them and, okay. and that. But I do make note of them. Yeah. As uh, the night goes on, you see them three more times in different places, doing much the same. Walking in, not really being noticed, not paying attention to, or not being paid attention to, kind of looking around and... Again, there's that sort of acknowledgement as they see you where you are in your corner. Are they doing anything else? Like, are they pickpocketing? Do they seem to be, like, doing anything suspicious, marking anything? Um, make a perception check. As you kind of pay more attention to them. Uh, that's a natural 20. Natural 20? Hey. Uh, for... Uh, 21. 21. Um, as you're kind of watching them come in, the weird thing is that they tend to stay physically distant from everybody around them, keeping about a foot distance. Um, and in fact, almost moving in a couple of cases in a very awkward way so as not to walk into somebody. Someone stumbles in front of them and they take a very circuitous route to get around them. Um, they aren't pickpocketing, or at least if they are, they're doing it invisibly because, and somehow at a distance, which would be a great trick, but probably not in this case. But what you do kind of pick up on is the fact that they're kind of looking around and observing things and very deliberately not interacting with anything. And that's when you realize they walk in through open doors. They don't push chairs out of the way. They don't touch anybody. They don't push through the crowd. They just move around. So we are due to take a break, um, but I do want to see if Medrick has something particular you want to do for the end of the evening. And what we'll do is after the end of the evening, we'll call it a night. We'll come back to the next day. Okay. Um, I was thinking, because uh, when we were fighting uh, Taraz, uh, I, I forget his name, it's been so long, but uh, he mentioned Clockwinder and Dr. Marigold was partying or at the carnival or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if I could like try to find him and ask if he's heard anything more about Clockwinder. <laughs> okay. I mean, not if he's like having a good time with the stage, but I mean. Well, it, make a, <laughs> an investigation roll as you look around for Clockwinder. Right. For a uh, Marigold. Or sorry, for Marigold. Investigation. And they're working through the crowds and oh, seeing no. where people are. Um, several times you're, you're, uh, you're met That's along the way with people, uh, kind of clapping you on the shoulder and very drunkenly pointed, you're the Fini, Fini, Fini. You're that guy. Yeah. 
uh, yeah! not, not even really able. Just, yeah, there's sort of the, 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 the celebratory frat uh, uh, cheer coming back to you. Uh, and that happens so frequently, you find it difficult to kind of locate anybody. Uh, and there's enough people moving around that uh, if they're if they're out, um, they're not out in any of the the, uh, the out on the street things, or rather, Marigold's not out on the street things. Um, so you're really not sure where to look, and so you pass by Marigold's place, and the place is dark. There's no no response when you knock on the door. Uh, looks like right, well, uh, um, they're still out somewhere. Okay. Well, I'll just go to. Uh a pub and have a few drinks and then go back to the Temple of Ignis. Okay. Actually, I'll uh, try to find uh, Lysandra, the girl that uh, I rescued from that sea devil attack. Okay. Make another investigation check. As you try to find another needle in this delightfully large haystack. 14. Okay. Because I remember uh, yeah. the pub I, like she was sleeping at. And, her, and that's... Her that's that's exactly the, the, the clue which gives you a better chance of understanding it. You head back to that particular pub and uh, um, Lysandra sees you when you step in through the door uh, and then kind of, <laughs> you, it's loud in there. There's a lot of people talking, but she's talking to somebody sitting at the bar and there's that sort of uh, moment where uh, you, you kind of, uh, we'll make an insight check. Let's just do it that way. We'll see how this how this rolls out. Thirteen. Okay. That's that's enough to kind of catch catch as she sees when you come in, and there's a sort of shift in her in her in her shoulders, as in, oh thank God. <laughs> and she kind of <laughs> she kind of finishes her her drink, uh, taps the uh, the the uh, rather inebriated fisherman. Uh, on his knee as she steps up from the bar and rushes over uh, to greet you at the bar uh, and grabs your hand and proceeds to walk out the door with you. Thank you for coming <laughs> to pick me up. Let's go. Uh, yeah, no no problem. I was going to come in for a drink, but I guess we can go elsewhere for a drink. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Was that dude being a creep? Uh, he was over-enthusiastic. Hey. It, it's not, he's not a bad guy. He just... He smells like a fisherman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Lysandra proceeds to take you to another bar. This one, it seems like pretty much has wound down for the evening. Uh, and there's still people there quietly drinking at different tables. Um, when Lysandra takes you in, um, she kind of has a lot to fill you in on. But it's mostly kind of the little things uh, that she's noticed um, since, the, since the attack and how, you know, there seems to be a lot of fear still in the town. And while the party is turning over a lot of that fear, there's still need for something. There's yeah. need for leadership. There's need for uh, someone to, to step up. And you get the not-so-subtle hint that she's trying to suggest to you that you should take a leadership position. I'll, in, in turn, I'll tell her that... Uh the temple of Agnes is like starting to get, is starting to get restored. So for, for temporarily, I have a leadership position, but, and I can be a leader sometimes, but good, good. I don't know. I'm considering it, but and she's about to tell I, you. I think leadership more. has too much administration, too much paperwork. And if I just get bogged down in that, I can't be, well, a helping people and b fighting. <laughs> did I ever tell you what I did for a living? No. I'm an accountant. Really? I like paperwork. And she's about to continue talking when someone uh, starts singing in the side corner, or uh, side corner, in the side of the, the room, and the whole room starts to get into the rhythm of the song. Uh, it's an old sea shanty uh, talking about uh, the ship that went down and then came back up. And the whole song is this weird allegory about essentially uh, vomiting, <laughs> But mm -hmm. it has people kind of rolling in the aisles, laughing, and there's a couple of new new things. And suddenly the whole room is sort of come back to life again, uh, and they're kind of singing and dancing. And even Lysandra actually asks you to dance uh, and to join in with this weird crowd of of, of people uh, that are that are that are dancing. Do you accept? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, make a uh, a performance check, or if you have another dancing skill. Uh, I would be happy to. If you uh, you can use dexterity instead of charisma, if you want, in the performance check. 
No, I'm using performance because I my, my charisma is higher than my dexterity. <laughs> okay. And that's a three. I guess oh, I've had wow. too many drinks. Yeah, you're not quite getting <laughs> the beat properly, and it doesn't seem like it matters as the entire room is practically off beat. And at one point, even the person singing and slapping his knees kind of misses his knee, and the whole room <laughs> kind of lurches, kind of missing the beat a little bit. Uh, but it does seem to be a, a, a happy time yeah. uh, for that evening. Uh, and and there, there's nothing particularly romantic about what Lysandra is doing. It's more of that she sees you as somebody she can believe in, and she wants others to see that as well. And she, at that particular point, while she does have a job, is willing to help you with some of the paperwork of leadership. Yeah, that would be great. I'll definitely keep that in mind. And yeah, I saw it more like as a catching up with old friends kind of thing. To kind go of, yeah. yeah. Um, and you're not a fisherman. And you get the impression that she's <laughs> tired of talking to fishermen. Because there's a lot of fishermen in this town. She has no interest in fish. Yeah, yeah. Um, she Although will. I can't it. produce smells like barbecued fish. <laughs> <laughs> produce barbecued fl- fish. Very specialized spell, but it does work. Or produce so. barbecued anything, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, make- and I'll ask her if she can keep a near out for someone called Clockwinder. But apparently, he's very private and possibly dangerous. All right. Sounds weird. I'll briefly explain. Uh, actually, no, I won't go over the whole like underwater adventure we went on. Okay. What do you tell her about Clockwinder? He makes devices and he could be a uh, useful in an investigation that me and my friends are currently what's the word I'm looking for person of interest let's just say okay about some possible dark things that are going on in the city is he dangerous it's possible okay I have a few friends I'll keep an eye out and I'll, I'll let her know where the where his where his uh, warehouse is, but that she should not enter it. Sketchy part of the warehouse. Yeah. I mean, if he's a very private person, as I've been told, uh, chances are there's a lot of traps in there. Well, I always know where to find you. Well, not really. I know where to leave a message. Yeah. Temple of Ignis or, yeah, or the Three Bells. <laughs> Um, and you spend a, a delightful evening. Make a make a perception check. Eight. Okay. Uh, the crowd still continues to to chant on into the evening, and you realize at one point you have never paid for a drink. They just keep arriving. Hmm. Uh, and. We're going to call this to a break for the moment. We haven't taken a break for a long time. Uh, And we'll be back with the next morning and possibly the hangovers, depending on how much fun you guys had. So uh, we're going to, I think, what was that? Annie specifically had one drink. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Medrick had it given to him. Yep. And Silas is at home, so it's really only Medrick's problem the next day. Well, I've only... No, he... He's not going to get too wasted. <laughs> it's more of, you know, you haven't what, so what much was lost count percentage in that there. drink. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. You haven't so much lost count as you never had a count to begin with. So, um, but I, I, it's not necessary that Medrick gets drunk. I'm just saying that he never had any concern. Oh, he's going to get tipsy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go to the pause screen. We're going to pause for about, let's say, 12 minutes, make it a round number. So 540, we'll reconvene and we'll continue on with the next day. All right.